Well, here we are with four distinguished panelists. And by now, I'm sure you're scared of your microwave, your toaster, the car, you know, and of course, remember, it's connected to the smart grid. But look around you. What about that mosquito, you know, spring? What about those tires, right? What about the birds? Lots to be scared about. But I think what was interesting for me is to hear from Jim Crow and then the president of, former president of Estonia, a lot of these threats have existed for many, many years. They do get deployed in different ways. But then what we're going to consider today is how technology might help us get ahead of these threats. And it's, it's a theme that you know, our keynote speaker just brought up about you know, these threats are there, and yet there are new technologies like antibodies that could help us put a ring fence around the next um, infectious disease that breaks out so that it doesn't become a pandemic. So what we're going to do is now talk about artificial intelligence, sensor technologies, scaling up using software platforms and the cloud, and biosurveillance, all pulling it together to see how we can get ahead of the next pandemic. So without further ado, I'm going to start with each of the panelists speaking from their own perspective of where they see the science and technology uh, making the future a bit safer and better for us from these bio threats that are all around us. So what I'm going to do is now start with Commander Niels Olsen. And um, he is the Chief Medical Officer of the Defense Innovation Unit, as you heard from the introduction. But what you also don't know is that he was uh, uh, coordinating the Navy's uh, 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 the Navy's attempt to manage the COVID-19 outbreak on USS Theodore Roosevelt. And in recognition of his achievement, he was named the Sailor of the Year in 2021. So not only does he look at technologies all the way from sensor technologies to pathology, he was at the forefront of managing one of the most severe outbreaks in this pandemic. Commander. Uh, thank you. So um, my... Uh, undergrads in physics, so I spent a little more time thinking about uh, some of the math, uh, maybe not as much as uh, some of the other folks here, but uh, you know, there's this crossover of um, how, the, how you do some of these things, and um, research uh, goes a long way towards preparation generally, and I think we really saw that in this pandemic where all sorts of researchers leaned in very quickly. Um, the, uh, Jim brought up some uh, uh, great things I, I had meant to bring up. Uh, I'll point out to his uh, aviation example, Alessandro, uh, I'm going to hopefully get this right, Vespignani, um, he did a, a great simulation very early in the pandemic uh, demonstrating what the probability is of various countries getting infected relatively quickly. Uh, and you can imagine that sort of, um, if we know there's something that's gonna happen, let's titrate that into the international transport system and see how it uh, hits different countries at different times. Um, you can imagine uh, that could be useful for uh, once you've surveilled and you've identified something, what could happen next. Um, there are uh, all sorts of uh, things like that that uh, got spun up very quickly. Um, for the international relations folks in the room, uh, probably you've heard of Clauschwitz. Does anybody know what Clauschwitz died of? Cholera. <laughs> so infectious disease uh, is a very real problem um, for the military and remains so. We spend a significant amount of our money uh, uh, $50 billion a year on uh, health protection for the force. Um, Global Emerging Infection Surveillance Network uh, has locations throughout the globe. Uh, the uh, armed forces institutes like AFRAMS in Thailand, NAMRU 2, uh, NAMRU 6, uh, Peru and, and Bangkok, or sorry, uh, anyway. So th there's a significant amount of this stuff. We're very interested in uh, how to respond to these things, so I'm looking forward to hearing from our other folks on, on what they're doing as well. Thank you, Commander. So, so 
So next here is Dr. Ethan Jackson, and we are proud of the fact that he's a Vanderbilt alum. I'm proud of that. <laughs> and after graduating from Vanderbilt in 2007 <coughs> with a degree in computer science, PhD in computer science, he joined Microsoft Research, <coughs> where he heads a program that's titled Premonition. And it's about, uh, again, uh, understanding the, the bio threats that are there in the environment so that you can get ahead of future events like the one that we are discussing recently. So I will let Ethan speak yeah. about his work. So probably the first thing on your, you would all ask me is why Microsoft is sitting here. Bear with me, I'm gonna delay that question for a moment because um, I was reflecting on the really interesting you know, last few days. So I'd like to try to connect cyber and bio a little bit and then kind of go back to, to why Microsoft. So um, if we kind of double click into the cyber, what's the relationship between cyber threats and bio threats? I think you know, from the perspective of non-kinetic threats, um, they're interesting in that they're both complex and counterintuitive in, in some unusual ways. So let me uh, cite some high school you know, physics equations, apologies for that, for the physicist next to me. Um, about why they're different. So scalability. If we talk about kinetic weapons, k equals one half mv squared. We put in a linear amount of mass, we get out a linear amount of, of uh, effect, right? Um, we talk about a chemical weapon. Uh, these are dosages in you know, micrograms per kilogram. So linear amount of mass, linear amount of effect. Yes, the mass is small. Um, nuclear weapon, weapons, E equals mc squared. Okay, still linear in mass, but the c squared matters, you know. The, the, we don't really care about the mass anymore. But the point is that when you go from there into the cyberspace, now it's not linear anymore. We can, of course, weigh software. We could weigh electrons, but let's not do that. Let's just make the point that that, that replicates, that threat replicates, and it can do so exponentially, which puts it in the mathematical sense in an entirely different ballpark, you know. Um, biological threats, same thing. Right? We talk about the basic reproduction number, the R0. Fundamentally, when that is greater than one, we're in an exponential scenario. It's different ballpark from different threats. So there's a connection there, I think, in the overall dynamics of cyber and bio. Why are they both difficult to wrap our heads around? Why are they both difficult to, to manage? Um, so just kind of reflecting on the, on the conversations today about you know, uh, threats. OK, the other thing, too, is complexity. That's the other topic I want to bring up. So there's this really interesting theorem in mathematics, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, that says something a bit mind-blowing. It says, if you give me a software component, and you know, this is what Janusz studies and, and his team studies, if you give me a software component and you ask a question about it, there is no algorithm that can answer an arbitrary question about that software component. Um, we can build system complex enough that there's no algorithm that can tell us every single vulnerability in general in an arbitrary component. Um, we can build beyond our ability to understand the vulnerabilities that are there. Now jump to the biological context, where we know those are more complicated than systems we engineer. Um, and you know, I look at the talk before us, and my mind is always blown when my biological colleagues are like, we figured something out, and you know, we built a countermeasure in a system that evolved, and we sort of, you know, compared to the ones that I'm an engineer that we build, are so much more complicated. So we have systems where you have you know, exponential effects, um, it means that you have to be able to understand what they're doing in short time scales or you're too late. We have systems with complexity which is incredibly high, so we do not even know all the vulnerabilities that sit there. And that makes these two spaces, you know, super difficult. Um, so is all hope lost? <laughs> like, what do we do? Okay, so I, let me go to my notes here. What do we do? I hope they're in my notes. Um, well, what we do in engineering is we monitor the thing like crazy, right? We monitor at the time scales that the dynamics can change. Um, that's what we do in the cyber domain. Um, that allows us to do two things. Uh, one, to catch problems when they're very early in the exponential curve. Um, and then secondly, to detect the, to, when we spread that monitoring throughout a system, to detect anomalies that did not require us to have a perfect knowledge and a perfect model of the threat. We can start to see it as deviating from what it should be um, so combine those two things together, monitoring at fine temporal scales, monitoring across the system, and now you have a way to address those two challenges, the scalability and the complexity of the threat that you're fighting. Um, okay, so now back to the original question that you might have had in your mind is why Microsoft. Um, I, what, what is missing, um, I think, in the biological space is that monitoring component, that thing that scales 
and really allows us to see what is happening in the environment very early. Um, that is what uh, the team I lead, the Microsoft Termination Program, that is our goal. Um, why does that make sense for Microsoft? Because this is a, we are a platform company. We are used to building heterogeneous systems that span sensor networks, um, data aggregation, prediction. Um, and so that's the, going back to why I'm sitting here and you know, why we look at that problem. Um, let me just say three more things, or you can tell me to stop, Padma, whichever. Um, okay, so, th so three more things. Um, uh, what, would, what would a sensor network look like that would need to scale, right? Um, and I think it has to have some difficult properties. One, it has to be cost efficient. So scalability from the technology side means somehow it has to cost efficiently exist. Um, and I don't think there's one technology to do that. It's, it's kind of a, uh, an ecosystem of technologies. And the way we have, we have thought about it is to look at some key threats. We have focused on things like disease vectors, um, but also there are things like agricultural pest, invasive species, things that we can sense digitally, where we change the monitoring cost to IoT style systems, which we understand how those operating costs work. Scale those out. Um, we brought a little demo for you in the back over there to give you a sense of what that might look like. Um, and now you have a way, a tip of the iceberg that scales. Um, second thing you need is to go better, do better than that. You need to now use that system to sample from the environment specimens that are information maximizing, that are worth it to take it back to a lab and do the really amazing work that was shown before. Um, filter environment down so that you're getting things that are useful to take through a more expensive process. And then that's the third thing we do, is once they're taken through a more expensive process like NGS, like sequencing, um, we will try to decode using AI all of the you know, sort of uh, biological material that is in a sample to really understand what was that thing telling us about the larger environment stitch that all together, maybe we can get to a place where we monitor uh, and respond like we do to cyber threats. Um, okay, I get off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. thank you. I think this point about exponential growth, I think that's something I think we need to revisit as we go along <coughs> with the panel. Uh, but now let's hear from Professor Janusz uh, Stefanovic, and um, he's my close colleague, and um, I'm extremely proud of the fact that he was sort of a pioneer when it came to uh, the, so the secure foundations of software. And it goes back to the question that Ethan just spoke. If you, if, you, if you ask a software system and see if it's secure, you really cannot answer that question. And so I think Janusz was among the first in the world to start thinking about building in security as an attribute by design. And, um, and, uh, and there's a connection here. Uh, uh, Janusz is also the thesis advisor of Ethan. So, Janusz. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Padma. So, let's get back to Microsoft. Uh, two decades <laughs> ago, <laughs> two decades ago, uh, Microsoft did an interesting thing. Uh, in the early 90s, a C compiler cost about $30,000. Uh, Windows came up. Uh, and the C compiler, uh, compiler cost went down to about $300. Uh, it was called, uh, Microsoft commoditized basically uh, the software and the computing, and that changed completely the field. Uh, it opened up the opportunity to many people streaming, uh, and many people could get access to the technology with which uh, they could build complicated software. Now, uh, Ethan tries to do something like this. If you look at that uh, device, that glowing device there, what he envisions that uh, in a few years, hundreds, thousands of those network devices will be deployed in the physical environment, in the biological environment. It will open up a view. Uh, what is going on in the, bi in the biome? It will basically make it visible. And it make it visible such uh, that the platform concept is applied. It takes out the complexity from those applications that are built on the top of this platform, uh, which makes the biome visible, which real time produces the information about what we found in the biome, what kind of microbes, viruses uh, are there. And, uh, by taking out that complexity, it opens widely the field that other people can deal with it, can build up application in it, and can solve very hard, very difficult problems that are totally unsolvable these days simply because of the inherent complexity and the, and the related cost. So 
So ultimately, uh, that whole vision uh, to create a completely new platform which samples the biome, elevates it to the information technology, and build all of the mechanisms that, uh, that can be utilized is a, I believe it's a fantastic vision. Uh, what's needed for that vision working? Well, of course, uh, somehow Microsoft and other companies who will be involved in this uh, needs to build all of this thing. But also science needs to be there. Uh, a new generation of scientists needs to be created, built, uh, that will be able to handle it, that can get used to the idea that the information is available, cheaply available, and, uh, and they can let loose their visions on this. Very similarly as computing was deliberated uh, from these confines uh, 20 years ago, or 20, uh, 22 years ago. Uh, we have the luck, actually, that uh, the National Science Foundation created now a new directorate, uh, they call TIP, uh, which is the first DARPA-esque directorate in the National Science Foundation. Uh, they created a convergence accelerator program uh, which explicitly wants uh, that many different science areas in this context, computer scientists, virologists, pathologists, uh, epidemiologists, I don't even know the names of these, are, uh, are all put together to handle uh, different problems. And also they created a framework in which uh, the academics can work together with companies like Microsoft directly in the same project in a delivery challenge-driven way, very, very oriented and challenge-driven way. Uh, and uh, in, the, in this framework, we, uh, we are building now we are with Microsoft prototype applications uh, on the top of this imagined platform. And these prototype applications will be deployed in Houston, uh, in Harris County. Uh, and uh, next year, if uh, everything goes well, you will indeed see a, a hundred of these things all networked together, piping data uh, almost real time into uh, Microsoft Cloud, where a metagenomic pipeline generates the real time streams of what the things that are found in the biome. And we start building up healthcare related applications using a bunch of AI methods uh, that, uh, that, will, uh, that will handle finding rare events uh, in the information that, that try to solve interesting problems related to how to interfere uh, if events are detected, how to optimize the deployment of, uh, of vector suppressants uh, and these things. So I think it's a, it's a fantastic new world what we are looking forward to it. To be players. Thank you, Janos. Um, uh, we have with us uh, Colonel uh, John Williams. And after 18 years of active service uh, in the Army, uh, he joined us three years ago to start his PhD. And guess what? Next week, he graduates with a PhD <laughs> in three fast, extremely productive years. Uh, with uh, a PhD in interdisciplinary material science. I think he set a record, and I'm proud to say that his thesis advisor, Professor David Williams, is here with us. And after graduation, he is going to go back to the Army Futures Command, and he's going to be the scientific um, director of uh, the U.S. Indo-Pacific um, uh, field operations, uh, integrating science and technology with uh, field operations. Um, so uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, letting me be a part of this panel. Um, being able to be here at Vanderbilt and being at the summit, um, the Army's been really good to me. Uh, and because of that, I'm a very different kind of warfighter. Uh, it's, you send people to grad school so that we can understand science, have these conversations, and in my specific job, I'm an Army acquisition officer. It's my job to go out and procure and develop the technology to help us fight and win the nation's wars, to help us modernize, uh, and to innovate. I wanted to uh, differentiate between those two words because it's, they sometimes get used interchangeably, but they're not the same. Uh, modernization is incremental. It's doing the same thing slightly better with technology, um, faster, cheaper, something like that. But innovation is transformational. What uh, Dr. Crow was describing is the transformation. It's a new way of approaching the problem. 
And let's make no mistake about it, this technology, AI and biosensing together is innovative in nature. We're, we're approaching pandemics in a different way. Um, unfortunately, modernization is a whole lot easier than innovation because innovation requires buy-in. Right? Especially in large bureaucratic organizations like mine, the DOD, the Army, uh, World Health Organizations, They're, it's hard because the institutional inertia of the way we've always done it makes it difficult for innovation to take hold sometimes. Uh, and I'll give an example. Uh, I had the privilege of working for Dr. Moore at the Kim Bio Center at Edgewood. And in the Army, we, in, we invest in a lot of research and technology. Now, the way we do it is we fund it, we assign it a technological readiness level, then we do a lot of tests to mature it through different milestones, and if we're lucky, at the end of that, it'll tr either transition into a program of record or be transferred to one of our industry partners that will make a lot of money off of it. The vast majority of great technology that we create never gets there. It ends up in what we in the enterprise call the valley of death. Now, that's, that's not to say that innovation never happens. It obviously does. I've seen it. I've been a part of it. The Army pays me to do it. They brought me here to do it. Um, but you have to set the conditions for innovation to take hold. Uh, this technology is innovation that we want to take hold. So we want to talk about what do we need to do to set the conditions so this doesn't end up in the valley of death like a lot of other great ideas or bits of equipment. Um, so I, I'm just gonna say uh, four things that I would recommend from Lessons Learned. Uh, the first thing is you have to tell the story. We have to go out and find advocates, find people who are gonna champion the technology to tell the story. But when we tell that story, we can't tell it as a technological story. This is not an AI story. This is not a, a win for science. We're telling the story in terms of the problem it's solving to the audience that we're talking to. We're finding out, hey, S Sergeant Major, what's your mission? Because this capability is going to help you solve your problem. When we tell the story in terms of the problem we're solving, we get buy-in. Uh, number two, we have to tell the whole story, the good, the bad, the ugly. Innovation requires radical transparency. And I know that can be really hard for those of us uh, who are doing the work behind the scenes because we want to tell the good news. But sometimes we have to say, oh, we can't do that yet. Or we're not there yet. Or the dreaded, I don't know. I, I just don't know what's going on. But the people that have the problem, they don't want to be sold. They want to be helped. So tell them the whole story. You've done the work in research. You've done the work in development and in testing. Your good days are going to far outweigh your bad days. So take the time, tell the whole story, and build confidence in the system. Next, see the big picture. Our problems are all interconnected. You know, It's not just one problem owner. There are lots of people that have different parts of the problem. Just like our problems are interconnected, our solutions are interconnected. And the sooner you're able to see who else benefits from this innovation, who, else, who else's job gets a little bit easier, and the sooner you get them on board, you create uh, buy-in in depth, both horizontally and vertically. I did that wrong. Horizontally <laughs> and vertically. When you nest your success with a, a, a large depth of people that believe in your innovation, it's easier for that innovation to take hold. Uh, and the last one I'll highlight is you want to make sure you're ready to be flexible. The ground truth is changing. Usually it's changing because the technology you're suggesting is making it change. So the threat changes, and doc, Dr. Crow highlighted that. The threat's gonna keep changing, it's gonna mutate. Uh, your uh, techniques are gonna change. But innovation has an advantage over the status quo because it has just as much time in the ground truth as the status quo. But if you as the advocate are flexible and adapting that innovation to the changing truth, it has more opportunity to stick not just because you know what's going on, but because the problem owner is now bought in to the innovation with you. They're building reality with you. So tell your story, tell the whole story, see the big picture and be flexible are great ways to set the conditions for innovation like this to take hold. 
and I'll stop there. Thank you, Colonel. That was so inspiring. I knew I had a question in mind, but I'm just kind of, you know, fascinated. I'm just reflecting on what you're saying because, you know, what you're talking about here is a very important principle, right? It applies very broadly to the innovations here, to the innovations that we're seeking across the space. And, um, and I think telling the story, I think that's something we should all reflect on here because we often get carried away by the science and technology, but, you know, it can't take root and grow on this uh, as uh, Colonel Williams put it, you can really tell the story and the good, bad, and the ugly. So do we need to make a Western movie out of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think part of it too, and, um, and, and I think there's a technological side to what we're saying, but it, it's gonna take a whole myriad of advocates with different approaches to the technology. So the, the great work from, uh, from Premonition, right? There's an, there's an algorithm piece, right? There's a, uh, an AI aspect of it. There's also a biosensor piece. There's also a force projection piece. Where do they need to be arranged? Uh, and there's questions like that that different people are gonna have to tell to different audiences. Um, and, and if I could just yes. follow on to that, um, th uh, thank you uh, for pointing to the exhibit, but you know, um, <laughs> The, the, the other thing I, I, I think that's worth highlighting to, to your point about the horizontal is um, the problem we're talking about is so complicated. There's no one entity you know, that, that can solve it. And so we may, plug, we may provide a puzzle piece. Um, and ideally, uh, maybe another way to say what you're saying is there needs to be buy-in and why that puzzle piece, what problem is it solving? But then what you really want to understand is how does it syner synergistically allow other pieces? And those will be made, importantly, by you know, research done here. It will be made by, by industry, by innovation happening in DOD. And you want to set the, con the conditions for all of those to kind of plug in together, because no one entity can, I think, solve a problem that, that is that complicated. Um, so yeah, totally uh, this amazing advice, yeah. Um, to draw away from the exhibit. Yeah, uh, please, please. I, brought, I brought my own yeah, exhibit. You um, so one thing that doesn't get after is um, something that infected a human. So what you'd like to do is identify things that infect humans. Ultimately, uh, the human is the final sensor. So the sick person is the one that tells you that there's going to be an uh, outbreak, an epidemic, a pandemic. Um, we have a, a different sensor system, but you know, again, it's that they work. You can imagine together. Uh, so this is a, a wearable and a ring uh, that uh, push data to the cloud. Uh, we have another version that works uh, offline, um, and it identifies uh, features that uh, predict uh, inflammatory response 48 hours before symptom onset. If you work out a uh, cohort that gets infected, the first person, the second, third, fourth, um, if you go with uh, this system, it's called RATE, uh, Rapid Assessment of Threat Exposure, um, you can isolate people earlier, which reduces the impact to your workforce more than masking, <coughs> um, significantly more than masking. You can also imagine you, you've got this on deployed forces, put it out in uh, places where the Global Emerging Infection Surveillance Network has assets, and as soon as they seem to be having signs of, of inflammation, go collect a sample, collect a couple of samples, and you know, send them off to the labs for sequencing. Now you can start talking about, well, all right, this is what's out in the world, Maybe we can go tell that thing or, you know, um, non-human sensor networks what to go look for. So, you know, I, I would think you know, we haven't figured all these things out yet, right? But we, we got to start figuring out how all these things are going to link up and together. Um, and then th this, by the way, is an entirely separate artificial intelligence system. You know, it's, it, it's using its own labels and inferences to come up with something. And I, I want to reinforce... This was trained with 286,000 uh, patients worth of data from hospitals all over the world and then tuned with 11,000 uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine data in a project that cost several million dollars worth of watches and rings. Um, artificial intelligence 
systems where these problems become consequential, it's not some data scientist at Facebook throwing together an algorithm. This is a significant capital investment and you know sometimes poured concrete gets involved, right? So you need to think about which ones uh, are worth investing in and start thinking about you know where are you going to start making your bets. You know, just reflecting on this conversation, right? We all agree that no one can do it alone, and you know, this came up with General Nakasone talking about partnerships, right? And obviously, there are partnerships, right? DARPA funded Jim Crow, and then you know, got him to do this in real time. I mean, you've been doing this rapid project, Microsoft, NSF, so many of these agencies. How do we sort of come together, you know, in a more, I mean, today is fantastic. Yesterday was just as fantastic because, you know, here we are from all these different communities talking openly about some of the challenges and how we can get ahead of them. But how do we do this in a sustained basis, right? Because, I mean, there's so many ideas flowing here about this exponentiality, right? How do we come together to get past it? How do we do this in a better way going forward? I mean, what can we do? Like, what can each of us do from the institutions we are in and how do we tell the story? How do we tell this bigger story about partnerships? What are your thoughts? Well, one good sign uh, that it's getting in the forefront of thinking uh, that a couple of years ago, the National Science Board brought out the, uh, the 10 big things uh, for NSF. One of them was convergence. And what they mean by convergence is exactly what you described, uh, that to, uh, to create uh, construct, uh, project construct, ch primarily challenged event project construct in which the goal itself forces and provides a framework for a number of disciplines to work together to achieve a, a goal. So for example, in this project, uh, what I described, uh, not only the biologists and computer scientists uh, work together, but it turns out that we need uh, social scientists simply because the privacy problem related to these kind of devices uh, is tremendous. Uh, it turns out that if you, uh, if you put someone, uh, someone's yard in someone's area device and an event is detected, then uh, if it is publicized, then it impacts the real estate prices in the, uh, in the whole area. So many, many complicated issues that are related to the social context. So these, uh, these folks need to be present. The sustain and the economics of the whole thing requires that uh, that economics work together. So, for example, NSF created a, a whole mechanism that all of us who are involved in this project are trained basically in a business school manner. So, uh, so I think that I see the sign that uh, that the agency try to find the solutions for this integrative construct, and that's crucial. Um, so, one for very specifically in the social science thing, for anybody doing international relations, the Nagoya Protocol, uh, write that one down please, because it precludes the uh, uh, transfer of biological material or information from signatory countries, uh, many of which are in the South Asia region. So uh, that makes it very hard to monitor things coming uh, from there. And by the way, that's where a lot of these coronaviruses are coming from and many other viruses. So um, if someone's got thoughts on, on how to work with that system uh, or, or perhaps modify it, that, that would be a great uh, thing to work on. Um, another bit of collaboration. So uh, I think a lot of people look at the government as you know a, a funder, uh, and we certainly do a lot of that. Um, we're look, I'm here looking for good ideas. Um, we also uh, collaborate in other ways, so cooperative research and development agreements for you know, Microsofts of the world, knock knock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, uh, support uh, things, we have resources other than uh, money. You know, we have ranges, we have personnel, populations, uh, treatment facilities, all, all sorts of uh, resources that can be brought to bear, uh, and you know, if you've got problems, and maybe you've got a company that wants to go after something, but you're lacking one of those things, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I wanted to uh, add just a random plug, and not at all because he was on my committee, but Dr. Adams' work uh, <laughs> uh, here 
at Vanderbilt working with Soldier Initiated Innovation. Um, that was, Vanderbilt was the very first institute to form an educational partnership agreement with Army Futures Command. We stood up a brand new four-star command to say, let's get better at getting new technology out to the warfighter. And the first institution that said, hey, we'll help, was here. And we took advantage of the fact that there is a light infantry division an hour up the road to say, bring us your problems. We've got a lot of smart people who can start working on it. That combination of those of us in uniform are wise and the ability of the university to produce hows and whats creates opportunities for collaboration and innovation. And the idea is that that can be expanded on and maybe invite industry to say, hey, let's take a part of this because they can commodify those <laughs> uh, whats and, and, and hows. But more interaction between our, our various communities to, uh, to add missions or purpose to capabilities that are produced and being developed here uh, gives more opportunities for great innovations or great technology to be birthed. Yeah, can, can I add, now I'm obligated to add one thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so on, on the privacy side, I think that's a good example and actually relates to the talk yes, yesterday about baking in security, baking in privacy from the very beginning. Um, and it was those discussions with biologists, with social scientists, which, you know, says there are some sensors to put in the environment and some that you cannot put in the environment because that privacy security risk makes it not worth it. Um, so just because, Giannis, you opened that one, um, that led to a lot of the design decisions you know, that have to go all the way through engineering disciplines, all the way through even sort of data sharing approaches. Um, so that interdisciplinary nature on the technical side, uh, engineering, societal, biological is all, you know, I think really, really important. Um, but then going back to the bio threat, sort of how do you, um, who should you all be talking through in the bio threat landscape? Can I throw something out there that's maybe, uh, throw out, I'll throw out something a little bit random. Um, uh, would we ever have a cell phone network if we only used it to call 911? Hmm. Or would we look at that and be like, that was way too expensive to build you know, a global thing if we only used it to call 911. Instead, we have the cell phone network because it's a foundation of our digital economy. And as a result of that, you know, we have tested things in, in remote parts of Tanzania. We have a cell phone reception. We can get data out you know, from that location because that system provides value in many different angles. So then going back to bio threats, if we do have much more data about the environment, and let's say most of that data, maybe 99% of it isn't a new virus, it's a new pathogen, but maybe it is telling us something that's important about climate policy. Maybe it's giving us information about sort of you know, uh, therapeutics that can be inspired by what biology is telling us. What does it mean to take the haystack and then really think through its overall value so that you can you know, economically sustain the scale, of, you know, the scale of monitoring that we all, I, I think, really reflect on COVID and saying, yeah, we, we want that. We, we, you know, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely look at the value of the data as a whole. So for th this study, I think we actually only got uh, on the order of several hundred positive tests and a ton of other data, most of which we haven't really done much with. But if you look at the cost of collection, it was $60 million worth of data. Um, if you look at wearables, uh, you don't want a wearable that detects COVID. Uh, yep. You know, if I, if I go down the, I need a wearable for every algorithm, uh, I'm not gonna have to wear body armor, I'm just gonna be covered <laughs> in watches. Um, so let's not do that. Uh, instead, look at, you know, these as more as, I'm a pathologist, it's a clinical laboratory sampling mechanism, right? Uh, a all the physicians in a hospital can order off the same vial of blood. Um, and I can get all sorts of different test results. I can get all sorts of different test results over you know, this system. So let's look for good systems that get quality data, develop those, um, and you know, there, there's gonna be a fair amount of churn as you figure out what those are. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at that thing over there and it uh, reminds me of some very old school tech from uh, Uniform Services University where they've basically got a jar with some cheesecloth over the top. But you know what, it works pretty well. And um, 
how much, you know, where's the balance between the extraordinary high end and, you know, cheesecloth? Maybe, maybe I need 50 of one and one of the other. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. What are some other thoughts? I mean, this is just, uh, you know, very thought provoking, right? I mean, we talk about these exponential networks of, you know, just not, and to your point, right? I mean, will the cell phone be a success if we were just using it to call 91? Probably not. So how do we sort of change the equation? Like, how do we make this? Uh, you know, there is so much economic, societal benefit to it. I mean, how do we somehow democratize it? How do we monetize it? How do we sort of make this sustainable? Because to your point, right, I mean, there is a lot of innovation here uh, in academia, in defense labs, all over. But then it's a the question, how do we take it out into the real world in a way that it becomes part of the social fabric and we can actually do good with it, right? We can really get ahead of the other pandemic. And I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts on that. But you know, as you reflect on that, you know, here's the pop question, right? You're doing all these surveillance things. You get a strange DNA material. What do you do with it? Come on. So. <laughs> Who do you send it to? OK, I'm giving you a hand. <laughs> The person's so, here in the audience. <laughs> yeah, who's, who's ready? <laughs> well, so, yeah, I mean, concretely, I, I know exactly who in the military I send it to. Uh, <laughs> he may send it to Jim. Uh, Jim Jim's at the, very, at the top of a very tight pyramid here. Um, but, yeah, th th there are a relatively small number of folks. So you have to keep in mind, like, once you have a mosquito, you don't know that it has dengue, yes. right? You have to like, all right, I've got a bunch of mosquitoes. And it doesn't matter what the mosquitoes have until somebody gets sick. So we had dengue fever. He brought it up. It was kind of nice. Um, we got PCR technology finally at Naval Hospital Guam uh, shortly after dengue fever showed up for the first time in 97 years. And all of a sudden, everybody got interested in mosquitoes. Um, but no one actually knew what to do with all this, inf this uh, stuff. So you, know, you put it in a freezer. And then you go call the person at Naval Health Research Center and say, hey, I got this stuff. I'm going to mail it to you. He's like, well, OK, I guess we'll have to figure out what's in there. And so then he has sequencing, right? So I can do PCR. But I can't really know what to do PCR-wise until we have a sequence to target, right? So that's how these things generally work is I can generally kind of figure out that there's like mosquitoes. Now I can figure out there's PCR, there's a, a target, of, but I can't really know which target until I get the sequence. So it actually goes very quickly up to the highest level and then actionable uh, kind of second order intelligence comes back down, um, which I suppose is similar to the cyber virus detection problem, right? Where you, it's not every single uh, computer is generating new signatures, right? Somebody has to go identify this is legitimately a new target and here's your signatures. So that gets pushed back out. So uh, I don't think that network is perfect yet and, and certainly could stand improvement if anyone has suggestions. Well, well I, I was just going to offer uh, this is a great way to connect to the, last, to the last talk. So what we just described is having a, an arsenal of tools prepared to respond, right? But how long does it take to get those things that you will need necessary. How long until you have enough prophylactics for an entire ship uh, when an outbreak is about to take, uh, take, take place? So does knowing early that the presence of a particular uh, virus or family of viruses is particularly possibly dangerous within an area, does that allow us to spark our supply chains early? Does that allow us to pre-position some capabilities? Does that allow us to get some things on the water? Worst case scenario, you have to turn it off. But does that extra amount of time, that early detection, allow us to be better prepared uh, so that it, isn't it doesn't have to spread across the entire ship or throughout the entire formation before we're able to respond to it? So Padma, I, I'm going to turn your question the opposite yeah. way, which sure. is, so you, you asked, what do you do with the DNA? Uh, the way that we have been trying to evaluate this, when I say we, I mean in the, the context of, uh, of the greater Houston area with, with Harris County Public Health, is the model sh ideally shouldn't be that DNA shows up and then you're like, oh, yes. that's a bad thing. But rather, why, what value did you anticipate deriving from that DNA in the first place? And if there's no model around that, if it's only, there's 
most of the time zero. It's not interesting. And then like maybe once every 100 years, there's this interesting thing. Then it suggested that, in, that the information maximization model is missing. Yes. Um, and that makes it difficult to, to sustain. So there, we are experiment, experimenting with a range of how would you try to make a definition of what do I expect to get from that unit of DNA? Um, and we're looking at um, you know, starting with, uh, can, you care, can you use uh, DNA as a double check to verify that AI is identifying the right species, for example? And that's a cheaper method. You need a smaller amount of DNA. Um, and if you can do that, it should acquiesce. You should terminate sequencing when you approximately reach the number of species in the environment. Why is it interesting? Because what it says is that maybe you need to, if you had a perfect system, you would only run 100 sequences. That's not that on budget. But you forward deploy the capability that when something pops up, that system is in place to say, I, I, I don't, AI, I don't know what this is. You know, AI throws up its hands. This is weird. System is there now to immediately decode it. Um, and so because of that sort of thinking, um, in Harris County, these systems are deployed now. And they have that capacity there now. They can pivot that if something were to change and, you know, for example, pivot it to surveillance of, of, of you know, wastewater, for instance. It would, have been, it would have been nice to have had that in place way earlier in COVID. But it's, um, that's just one example, I think, in sort of how do you build an information maximization story that says, uh, I'm not going to randomly look, but I'm going to go do this because I have a pretty good idea of how it gained my overall situational awareness of, the, of sort of the biological context. Um, question about the sustainability and, uh, and how to avoid the, the whole, uh, the, the, the Delia, the Belly of Death. death. <laughs> uh, well, of course, uh, it's pretty helpful in a project if a $2 trillion company is also involved in the project. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but irrespective, uh, the, this whole thing that in a challenge-driven project you want to look ahead and want to see during the research phase and the execution, where can it lead to? How you will monetize it? What are the different kind of economic models through which you, uh, you will sustain it? It's, it impacts how we think about the problem. So very early on, I have to give credit for, uh, again uh, to the NSF management for this. Uh, we were charged to go out and, uh, and do user interviews. We talked to physicians practicing physicians, and, uh, and we discussed with them potential use cases. Uh, if you had that capability and you have apps on, uh, on your iPhone in which a person can tell, I have these and these symptoms, and I, well, this was my trip I got, uh, what I took uh, lately, they can possibly spot that what is the probability of certain, uh, certain exposure to viruses. And, and we worked out many of these different kind of situations. Uh, Microsoft set up a very interesting construct with, uh, with Harris County Public Health. Uh, basically, they set up a non-for-profit organization uh, for the operation of that uh, whole mechanism. How a command and control center would look like in a public health organization, uh, which collects information about the, from the bio in a whole region. How to create a template for it that can replicate that model across the country. Uh, there, there are all sorts of interactions with other uh, groups, uh, with, uh, with the Department of Agriculture and others. They uh, even uh, totally uh, involved in, uh, in these things, we, uh, we know. So, uh, so what I want to tell here that that it's an interesting concept that uh, when you do challenge-driven res uh, research, uh, you have to spot all of these interesting areas that are all intertwined. The, the, the primary science development, the engineering of the problem, all of the social context and the impacts of the social context on how you build the system. And then finally, to see the goal, how you will monetize it, how you sustain it. And after all, why are you doing the whole thing? Uh, so the, 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 these are really interesting uh, points and all around the convergence concept. Can, can I add one other thing uh, with that to, to the great question? How often are we going back to learn lessons from the things that have happened in the past? Uh, what, what do we wish we knew the last time something went really wrong? Um, and what are we going to do differently next time so that we don't make the same mistakes? Are we actively learning uh, from these problems? Uh, 
we, we highlight just eight years ago, the 101st was deployed out to uh, West Africa to address the Ebola virus. And if you ask those guys, what are we supposed to do with the Ebola? They don't have the equipment, the tools. They don't know anything about uh, viruses, but here's a light infantry division in, uh, in West Africa. Well, where are our lessons learned? What are the things that we wish we knew about that deployment that would make things different the next time that we call on the 101st to go to West Africa? And specifically, to your point, what are the questions we need to ask that maybe this can do so that we set up that algorithm in advance to, to help us solve those problems? What, are the, what do we need to learn from? What do we need to do better? Um, yeah, so th there are a number of uh, systems for this. So the CDC has a cohort of uh, public health officers, epidemiologists that are out and about in the world uh, monitoring for these sorts of things. There is this interesting, you know, back to the health uh, information maximization problem. Um, you know, physicians are trained in medical school and in their training to become the custodians of these uh, uh, panels of symptoms and the storylines that go with them so that when they see it in the world, they can make that first reasonable guess as to what it could be and then order you know, a panel of tests to help narrow it down. And then once we have a good idea, ah, well, this appears to be influenza, let's send it to the big boys and they'll tell if it's a tell us if it's uh, you know, influenza A, B, C, or you know, some new variant. Um, I, I'm interested in this idea of bypassing that. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, many pediatricians would love, honestly, if uh, they did not have to deal with every single viral syndrome that came in the door. But if you could just go to uh, Walgreens and, or a drugstore, I should avoid using uh, specific <laughs> companies. But you go to a drugstore and um, get a lateral flow assay, and you know maybe a panel of lateral flow assays, and oh well, it's this thing. Here's your treatment, and out the door you go. Uh, instead of needing the extraordinarily uh, expensive version of a physician uh, who's been trained to do all these things. At the same time, if you do that, you get into the same problem you have with artificial intelligence systems currently, like, like with self-driving cars. If you only expose the pediatricians to the worst case scenarios where the machine failed, that's hard, right? If you're driving a self-driving car and it only dumps you back out into control right before a crash happens, that's bad, right? And if you're only experienced for the last thousand miles of driving has been right before an accident. That's not awesome. Um, so you've got to, you know, I, I get the information maximization problem, I, I think, but you've got to uh, think about the resiliency of this system. If there's anything we learned in the pandemic, like local resiliency matters. If you're, if you're tied into something that's, you know, three levels away, it, you know, you may be setting yourself up for a catastrophe you didn't anticipate. I love that point because we've, okay, so we've spent, you know, the last few days talking about mainly cyber threats, but what you, I think what you just highlighted is that cyber bio, you know, in their nature, they're similar, and then to monitor them, really, now there's a cyber component to monitoring bio, and actually in the earlier talk, that feeds back on then the synthetic biology we use to build an intervention, and this is, these are interconnected systems, so these you know, threats are interconnected. The way we will deal with them will be interconnected. The attack surfaces will be interconnected. Um, yeah, absolutely. So how do we de-silo, you know, the way we think about these different, these different types of, th of threats? This is this intriguing question, right? How do you bring the people in so that the people networks, you know, the people with the know-how, the people with, you know, the knowledge, you know, to fill in the gaps that AI has, I mean, and how does this become something interesting of its own right, right, where people want to check it or understand it or be engaged with it? I think that's a huge question here, I think, as we look ahead and try to connect technology with everyday, you know, people and what we go about. So I think we're almost out of time, but if we have just one minute, 
What keeps you up at night? Anyone? Oh, this is the weaponization question. Like, how do I, how do I anticipate somebody else figuring out biosurveillance problems and then flipping the storyline around to like, well, what happens if I put this virus in Kansas? Is the first mover the, the, the person who loses out or maybe it's the last mover, you know, the pr last country infected that really loses out? You don't really know. So um, contemplating who might be doing that and how we can detect that and figure out who's who in the zoo. It's a fun fact, probably uh, our friends in, in China are, have more US DNA than America does. There are at least 17 genomics companies in the US that are wholly controlled by Beijing. Uh, and uh, many of your hospital lab providers are sending samples to the lowest bidder. Okay. We're thinking about. I think that brings us back to what General Nakasone started off thinking, uh, getting us thinking about. So I think we are out of time and uh, we are out of time. I can take one more question. Okay, great. <laughs> Jane, help me, please. Well, please. I, I, will, yes. I will add one. Uh, one of the hard things is, especially when you're looking at technology and um, how are we going to maintain our technological edge? Uh, my vision for the next job is there's not going to be any more technologi technologically advanced theater than Indo-PACOM. That's my job. Well, well, how do I make sure that that happens? I can't chase after every good idea. I have to find the ones that, that matter or that will work. But the things that you pass over, we've got to make sure that they're not the things that come back and bite you, that you know the the other guys in our competition or conflict or whatever we're calling it has figured out how to make that their technological advantage. So our job is to understand it well enough to know not only uh, how can this help us, but how can this hurt us? What's our risk of not moving forward using this technology? And I think with that thought on strategic risk taking and innovation, I think we'll call this panel a wrap. Please join me in thanking all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.